So dear colleagues, we start in our seminar. Uh, usually we have much more scientists and PhD students, but today a big problem with electricity. We know about this and with internet, but I think our people can uh, look for this uh, presentation uh, later on our YouTube channel. Today, our speaker is Professor Paula Samari, distinguished professor of uh, University of Strasbourg, director of, of the Institute of Supramolecular Science and Engineering and director of the Nanochemistry Laboratory. He is a foreign member of the Royal Flemish Academy of Belgium for Science and the Arts, fellow of the Royal Society of Chemistry, fellow of the European Academy of Sciences, member of the Academy Europea, member of the European Academy of Sciences and Arts, fellow of the International Engineering and Technology Institute, and a member of other different academies and societies. He has obtained Laurea master's degree in industrial, uh, industrial chemistry at University of Bologna in 1995. In 2000, he has received his PhD in chemistry from Humboldt University of Berlin under Professor Rebe. Before joining the Institute of Supramolecular Science and Engineering, he has been permanent research, research scientist at Instituto per la Sintesi Organica e la Fotoreactivita of uh, Consiglia Nazionale della Ricerca of Bologna. He has published more than 400 papers in nanochemistry, supermolecular science, and material science with a specific focus of graphene and other two dimensional materials as well as a functional organic polymeric and hybrid nanomaterials for application in optoelectronics, energy, and sensing. He has been awarded numerous prestigious prizes, including CNRS Silver Medal, RSC Surface and Interfaces Award, Prix Andre Collet, and numerous other. He is associate editor of Nanoscale and Nanoscale Advances, and member of the advisory boards of Advanced Materials, Small, Chem Nanomat, Chem Fis Chem, Chem Plus Chem, Chem System Chem, Nanoscale Horizon, Chemical Communications, and numerous other journals. Dia Paolo, please, you can start your presentation. Perfect. Well, first of all, thank you very much, uh, Professor Chevanov, uh, dear Valentin. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be with you. Uh, and actually to give uh, my tiny, tiniest contribution to try to uh, say uh, support science in Ukraine, uh, support uh, what uh, you uh, are facing uh, in a crazy manner. Uh, we are, of course, against war. And, uh, and so you, you can trust in all our full support. Now let's move to science. And uh, what I'm going to tell you today is about what uh, uh, some of the activity that is done in my laboratory in Strasbourg. We are chemists by training, uh, but we do very interdisciplinary type of science, and you will see this uh, uh, during my presentation. Uh, now, we are interested in 2D materials, but that is not the topic of today. Today, I will uh, uh, explain you how we see, let's say, the uh, emergence of new functionalities coming out of organic materials when combined with, uh, uh, let's see, responsive molecules. And uh, so that is uh, the path towards multifunctionality. Uh, we try to embrace the supramolecular approach, which uh, allows you to allow us to have uh, a high control over the structure to achieve better function in hybrid materials. And so we go to, uh, uh, we, I will show you how we can make organic materials multi-responsive and this can be used also to fabricate, for example, multi-level memories. Uh, now, the, uh, I think that the, the, the way to introduce this kind of activity is the one of considering the Internet of Things, uh, which actually is a complex system. It's a network of physical devices, vehicle and other items that are embedded with the electronics, software, sensor, actuator, and network. And so the key words here are connectivity, and the fact that all these objects are able to collect and exchange data between them. So uh, Internet of Things is, a, a, let's say, is a characteristic of uh, our life uh, every single day. Uh, but if we instead think about what we do 
in our professional life, we do chemistry and we play with molecules and molecules and materials thereof, they have a certain chemical composition. Uh, the chemical composition determines the structures of our molecule uh, at the molecular and at the supramolecular level. And this kind of structure determines a number of properties. Uh, for example, mechanical properties, thermal properties, optical properties, electrochemical properties, electronic properties, and magnetic properties. So all these properties of our material are strongly interconnected among them. And uh, therefore, that is the reason why uh, I, I believe that is we are forced to think in terms of uh, the, a concerted control of all these kind of uh, properties or function to fabricate multifunctional uh, and multi-responsive devices for energy, auto-electronics and sensing. And that is the reason why, uh, since these properties are all interconnected, I introduced this term that is internet of function. Uh, now, our approach is the one of the bottom-up generation nanosystems uh, that starts from atom and uh, goes all the way down to fabricate functional supramolecular architectures. And uh, so they, uh, we exploit the uh, system chemistry approach in which we aim at translating an instruction that is encoded at the single molecule level into a function that is the one of the material. Uh, and uh, as uh, I think you have understood, we are very much interested in responsive molecules, responsive systems, and electroactive systems and uh, uh, because we find this to be the way to develop multifunctional devices for optoelectronics, energy, and sensing. So in our uh, activity, uh, we actually tame complexity. Uh, we tame complexity uh, by starting from uh, different systems, can be 2D materials, can be organic, can be inorganic. We make hybrid out of it, so uh, out of them. So we combine them. And in this way, uh, we start with increasing the chemical complexity, which brings us to an increase of the structural complexity. And after all, it will harness the functional complexity. Uh, we, uh, to do this uh, transition, we need to be able to control properties at different scales, from the nano to the macro scale. And uh, we uh, are very much interested in studying and understanding and controlling the relationship between architecture and function. And uh, so in my lab, I always stress that uh, <laughs> for me, it's really a must to control the structure because this is the only way to achieve better functions. Now, function, consider that uh, devices are typically monofunctional. If you think about uh, the most prototypical device that you have in electronics, that is the field effect transistor, the feed effect transistor can be turned on and off by applying a voltage to the gate electrode. And therefore, for this reason, it's manufactured. So it's like having a remote control that has a single button. So what I will show you today is that you can add the number of buttons in the remote control to make them multi-functional or multi-responsive. I will show you that you can add a second button to make it bifunctional, and even a third button to make it uh, tri-functional. This is purely done by interfacing different components. So the path to the multifunctionality is the one not really based on defining a specific type of materials, but rather in my lab, our approach is that we target a specific properties, can be transport of charges, can be ability to emit light, ability to change the state as a result of external stimuli. Once we have defined the property we want to achieve, at that point, we define which kind of molecule or materials we play with, okay? Uh, so it can be, for example, organic and polymeric semiconductor. In the case, we are interested in the application of electronics, photonics, and lightning. Can be molecular switches that respond to different types of stimuli. The stimuli can be photochemical, it can be electrochemical, it can be a magnetic field, it can be, a, there are a number of different types of, uh, let's say, external fields or stimuli that can be used. And this, of course, uh, has some application of electronics and digital signaling. And uh, for example, we also, as I mentioned, play with 2D materials. They are graphene related uh, uh, to dimensional materials. They, they have unique and outstanding properties, which render them uh, very interesting for application of electronics 
energy storage, membranes, and mechanical reinforcements, just to mention a few of them. So after all, as I mentioned, our approach is to combine different classes of materials as a way to assess multifunctionality. And so I will focus uh, today on uh, the combination of organic polymer semiconductors with molecular switches. And uh, so to do that, I have to introduce photochromic switches that are uh, small organic molecules that are able to undergo efficient and reversible photochemical isomerization between uh, different states. Uh, and these states, there's to be different type of uh, properties. And so here I have uh, uh, portrayed uh, the two most uh, famous photochromic switches that are uh, the azobenzene on the left and the diuretin on the, on the right. The azobenzene, uh, you can trigger the isomerization from the more extended transform to the more compact cis form with UV light. And you can go back uh, from the cis that is also called Z to the E that is also called trans by visible light or thermally. You can see that, for example, these two states, they have a different conformation and they have also different dipole moments. Uh, Diuretin instead, you can switch from the open state to the closed state with UV light. You can go back with visible light. It is worth to stress that these two states are thermodynamically stable. And actually, what uh, the property that is differs between them is the energy levels, as you can see from the cartoon here in the bottom. So our approach is a one of uh, so switching molecules as gate to translate an incoming input uh, that is a light input into a change of the properties of the material. And uh, so uh, we can actually think about a digital uh, switching between the two state uh, zero and one. Uh, so, but you can also think that the switching is done at the single molecule level uh, by addressing the molecule with the external stimuli. And this way one can change some molecular level properties like uh, the structure uh, the, electron, uh, the geometry, the dipole moment, the pi conjugation, uh, homolumo gap, redox potential. And this actually will uh, determine a change of the macroscopic properties of the uh, material. Can be shape, can be aggregation, uh, can be conductance. Uh, so let's say this switch is amplified to a, a bigger uh, length scale. Now, uh, how do we interface function? Actually, we interface function by uh, looking at interfaces in our, uh, let's say, materials or devices and try to decorate the interface with different functionalities. And so if we consider the field effect transistor as a prototypical, let's say, element for the today electronics, uh, field effect transistor can be, uh, let's say, uh, can have an architecture. The most common one is the bottom gate, bottom contact uh, in which you have the metallic, metallic electrodes that are physically sorbed on the dielectric surface. And then you have a semiconductor in the channel between the, uh, the source and the drain electron. Now, what you can do to add functionality is just to look at where you have interfaces and try to decorate the interface with this functionality. For example, you have an interface between the metallic electrode and the organic semiconductor. And this is where I numbered, uh, put the number one. So here you can add molecules that respond to a specific stimuli. You can do it in a symmetric manner in electrode one and the electrode uh, in the second electrodes. Uh, so and then you can actually also add another functionality at the semiconductor level by blending the semiconductor with another component. So our activity started actually nearly 15 years ago. And uh, when I, well, actually starting in 2003, when I started my independent laboratory, and then uh, the first paper we came up with was in 2007. The idea there was to uh, play with a, a highly rigid self-assembled monolayer made of, uh, uh, let's say, of a rigid molecule that is an azobenzene that was synthesized by Professor Marcel Mayer in Basel. And this azobenzene actually as a, a biphenyl on the two sides of the azo group, of the diazo group. And actually, it tightly packed like in arin thiols on the basal pane of gold, thanks to the presence of this sulfur unit here. And it forms a self assembled chemical sort of self assembled monolayer, uh, which can undergo isomerization from the trans 
to the CIS form with a very high yield due to the tightness of the packing and uh, let's say crosstalk between adjacent molecules. The CIS form in this kind of self assembled monolayer, it is more stable than in solutions thanks to the presence of pi pi stacking between adjacent molecules. And then one can trigger the back isomerization to the trans either thermally or with visible light. <coughs> so that actually, uh, this kind of isomerization uh, has been observed by scanning tiny microscopy uh, in, on the molecular scale. I have no time to present you this that uh, was discussed in this PNAS paper. Uh, we observed that we have a pretty large domain of uh, several hundreds of nanometers that can be switched with our uh, with the UV and visible light stimuli. And therefore, I, I decided to uh, perform the first experiment and to demonstrate that you can have a vertical junction based on conducting AFM in which you have a gold conducting substrate that is covered by a self-assembled monolayer of our molecule and use a counter as a counter electrode, a metal coated tip of an AFM. And we have been studying the uh, light responsive electrical characteristic of this uh, monomolecular junction. Uh, you can see that when the molecule in the, is in the more extended transform, the uh, currents are, are weaker uh, here in red, whereas uh, when you have the molecule that adopts the cis conformation, there is much higher current in the junction. And uh, so, of course, never trust. Uh, when you do uh, scanning probe techniques, so local probe techniques, never trust in single measurement. You have to do statistics, which demonstrate indeed uh, that the average resistance of our self-assembled monolayer, it is actually lower when you have a, a thinner uh, monolayer covering the gold electrode, whereas when this layer is thicker, uh, due to the fact that we have to turn it through a thicker barrier, the resistance is, it is higher. Uh, you can actually uh, plot the resistance as a function of molecular length. And despite we have only two data points, we can determine beta, that is a transition factor of tunneling that turns out to be about 0.45 Armstrong minus one, which is in good agreement with the typical uh, values of beta for uh, conjugated small molecules. That was a work done by Jeffrey Mativeski in our group when he was uh, working as a postdoc. As we were able to assert isomerization in much larger domains, we decided to use as a counter electron not anymore the tip of an AFN that have a diameter of a few tenths of nanometer, but actually a liquid compliant mercury drop, uh, which has a diameter of about two millimeters. And therefore, we could uh, actually, uh, upon using a substrate uh, transparent uh, like quartz, an ultra thin gold film of 15, 20 nanometer, we can shine light from the bottom and have in situ isomerization from the trans to the cis and vice versa, which is reflecting the IV characteristics that are here in the bottom. And actually, uh, without going to the details, what we found out that the self assembled monolayer behaves like a cargo lifter. It can exert a pressure on the uh, mercury draft to lift it up uh, when uh, it is uh, triggering the isomerization from the cis to the trans. Uh, the force that is exerted by a single molecule is very tiny in 10 to the power minus 14 Newton. Uh, but uh, actually, we have an Avogadro number of molecules that is exerting the, uh, let's say, switching simultaneously. And therefore, we can exert an overall pressure of the self assembled monolayer on the gold on the mercury drop of 10 to the power 5. Newton per square meters, which is pretty high in magnitude. Now, here, what I showed you is a possibility to switch, uh, let's say, junction, vertical junction, uh, thanks to the light illumination at different wavelengths of our self assembled monolayer based on the isobenzene. Now, vertical junction are not too interesting from the technological point of view. Uh, and therefore, uh, for the industrial level, we have focused our attention on horizontal junction which are those that are existing in a field effect transistor. And therefore, uh, Nuria Krivilers, when he was, she was working in our lab, uh, she has reported a very nice experiment in which essentially we took a bottom gate, bottom contact field effect transistor 
we coated the, the gold as drain and source electrode with the sum of the very same enthobenzene, and we put in the channel an air stable N type derivative. By triggering the isomerization with the UV light, we can reduce the uh, thickness of the layer of our organic layer for the injection of charges from the electrode into the semiconductor. And we can also go back uh, to the initial case, either with thermally or with visible light. And uh, uh, actually, this, uh, therefore, we can have a photo control over the operation of the feed effect transistor. This is something you can observe here, uh, both in the output and in the transfer characteristics. Uh, when you have the cis, uh, the molecule of the azobenzene that are in the cis form, the barrier is thinner, and therefore the current are higher, since we have tunneling through a thinner layer. <laughs> and uh, actually, we thought that there could be a role played by the different work function of the uh, SAM in the system transform, but actually different techniques that have been exploited demonstrated that the change in the work function in the two state is very, very modest. And therefore, uh, the uh, type of different current we observe is indeed due to the fact that we are injecting charges through a, a insulating barrier and we have a tunneling process that is ruled by the thickness of our barrier. Uh, so uh, you can see that we can make cycle upon illumination with the, uh, with the UV and visible light to trigger the transmission from trans to cis and from cis to trans. But after a few cycles, we have some fatigue and we don't see anymore the light uh, uh, responsiveness. And uh, this is due to the fact that uh, uh, we are working in a configuration that is a bottom contact, bottom gate transistor. It is known that in this configuration, the charges that are uh, from in the channel are those at the, uh, the very first few layer at the interface of the dielectric. So we have a very tiny area of injection from the electron to the semiconductor. And so there are very few isobenzene that will play a role here. And after a few cycles, they can undergo uh, fatigue or quenching. Uh, now, so what uh, if we want to go further and uh, we need to try to improve our system in terms of getting, uh, let's say, a photo switch that is bistable in the two states that has reduced fatigue uh, and that is a much faster switch because for digital electronics, we need fast switch. And so we decided to move uh, to direality. And that was done in collaboration with Professor Stefan Echt in Humboldt University, Berlin. And uh, this was the thesis of Thomas Muschatti. And so we changed the molecular design from azo benzene to diaretin and the device design from bottom gate to top gate. And uh, so you can see that uh, the gate uh, top gate is cytop based. In the junction, we put a thiolated diaretin. And uh, also we uh, decided uh, to, uh, in this case, to change the type of semiconductor to get high performance semiconductor in 2200. Again, course as a substrate allows to radiate from the bottom. And, uh, and so in this way, the use of top gate geometry enables to maximize the injection area. On the other hand, the use of diarrhea instead of azobenzene means that we are dealing with a photo switch that is uh, uh, no fatigue prone and actually that uh, it can be used to deliver high performance multifunctional devices. So the first way to test the switch of our uh, let's say uh, diaretin is the one of embedding it into a single uh, molecular thick junction in which instead of the mercury drop here with uh, indium gallium eutectic, and we could uh, monitor on the right the IV curves. You can see that we have an efficient switch between the two states uh, with the change of the conductance of almost two orders of magnitude. Now let's integrate this inside the real device. And you can see both in the linear and saturation regime that we can change the current through the junction. This can be read also in terms of change of the mobility through the junction in a highly reversible manner with very little fatigue. The threshold voltage doesn't change, so we are not really doping our system. And uh, what I like to stress is that thanks to the bistability, thermal bistability of the reality in the two states, we have a retention time of uh, the closed direct uh, sun that is exceeding five months. 
Now, other way to interface function is the one of uh, uh, blending. Blending can be done by uh, combining a semiconductor with a, a photoswitchable molecule. And so that was done by Manuele Orju, and we decided to play with the most prototypical type of uh, semiconductor, that is P3HT, uh, so polythiophene, and uh, uh, with uh, uh, combined with uh, diarylatin. Uh, now, uh, the, uh, let me show you how this was done. Uh, you start from a, a, you can fabricate a transistor based on pure P3HT. Uh, that is uh, this uh, material in orange in between the two volt electrodes. You can actually blend it with uh, the diarylatin. And uh, now we have uh, designed and synthesized together with Stefan Echt some diarylatin such uh, that uh, their homo level in the closed state is in the band gap of the P3HT and in the open state is out of the band gap. Now, what does it mean when you have a dopant whose level is in the band gap of the semiconductor? Uh, actually, when the level is within the band gap of the semiconductor, the dopant will behave as a trap for the charge of the semiconductor. <laughs> Whereas when it is out of the band gap, the interaction between the two are purely electrostatic. So overall, what we have done here, we have designed a system such that in the two state can, in the closed state can act as a trap and the open state non-trap, the charge transport in P3HT film. And so uh, we have then dispersed our uh, diary in, uh, in the channel of our uh, semiconductor that is filled with the semiconductor is our P3HT. And when it is in the open state, so the open state of the diarylatin are indicated with zero. And then here, if we illuminate with UV light, uh, with high power, uh, we can actually uh, trigger the isomerization of all the zero into one. And therefore, we are creating traps. And therefore, the charger will not flow as nicely as they did before. And then we can edit with visible light and go back to the initial case. You can see that we can uh, actually make cycle of uh, uh, from high current and with UV light we create traps and we lower the current. The visible light we go back to non-trap, and so we can have this kind of cycle with very very little fatigue. What I like to stress that is quite important: that the time response of our device is on the microsecond to the light stimulus is on the microsecond time scale. So this is very interesting for the technological application in electronics. Uh, now, you can do the very same game, but actually uh, starting instead of P3ST by using a, a polymeric uh, ambipolar material. And this was provided by Professor Ian McCulloch from Oxford University. And here you do the same game. You have to define where is the stands the homo and the lumo of our material. You can do this with the uh, electrochemical approaches, for example. Once you have defined the LUMO and the HOMO, you have to decide uh, the ideal diarylate in such that you can trap and untrap uh, at the, the old transport and another one for trapping and untrapping the electron transport. And therefore, we have uh, designed and synthesized with Stefan Act uh, these two different types of diarylate. And uh, of course, when you play with ambipolar materials, this is very important for the development of uh, uh, organic uh, CMOS circuits. Now, how have we fabricated our device? Now, there is a peculiarity that I have to stress that this kind of uh, polymer semiconductor to be ambipolar needed to be treated at 300 degrees. And that is a temperature to which we cannot expose the diarrhea. And so what we have done is we took a bottom gate, bottom contact, uh, uh, let's say, chip for a transistor. We deposit the polymer, <laughs> we heat it up at 300 degrees. Then we deposit a thin layer of diarytin blend on the top of it with the two different diarytin, one that is tailored to trap and untrap the uh, electron transport, and other for the old transport. And then we apply the, a mild temperature of about 80 to 100 degrees to trigger a, a permeation of the diarytin from the very top through the layer of the organic semiconductor that is thick, about 100 nanometer. And actually, we are certain that it reaches the interface with the dielectric. So 
uh, of course, we use bottom gate, bottom contact dielectric, uh, pre-pattern uh, chips. And uh, here in this cartoon, I want to show you how we uh, can study the light responsiveness of our material. We start from the pristine uh, semiconductor, polymer semiconductor. You see that my making cycle of UV invisible light, there is very little response to the light stimulus. Then if we add the uh, terbutyl uh, diarylatin, so we blend the semiconductor with the terbutyl diarylatin, we can see that actually there is only a response to the, uh, let's say, to the old transport, okay, uh, by doing cycles of UV and visible light emission. So we are triggering uh, uniquely the trapping and the trapping of uh, the holes. If you do the other counter experiment with direct fluorinated, you will observe that we have a trapping and the trapping of the electron transport. And if you deposit and permeate through the organic semiconductor layer, the blend of the two direct, you can see that upon emission with the UV light, we can trap both or an electron transport. And then with visible light, we can recover both of them. So uh, this is very interesting because we can have both different type of charges trapping and detrapping. This can be actually interesting for application inverter. Now, the other type of device that we wanted to focus on uh, are uh, light emitting transistors, organic light emitting transistors, which are great because they combine the function of the transistor in terms of the ability to transport charges with the one of the light emitting diode to emit light. And so it simplifies the effect of using this planar structure, simplify the device architecture. And actually, uh, uh, it allows to potentially reach very high efficiency. And uh, there have been some activity on light emitting transistor, not much uh, compared to light emitting diode, for example. And, uh, and people have, used, have been using different types of material. Now, what uh, I, we wanted to try to achieve is to in part, a external optical control to light emitting transistor. And uh, so uh, to make it uh, smart and responsive for high resolution displays. So that was the activity of Lili Hu. Now is back, she's back in China as professor, a full professor in Tianjin. And Saiyan Zhang is a associate professor in Chalmers University in Gothenburg. So what we have done, we have fabricated a optically switchable organic light emitting transistor. And uh, so in a single device, we have different functions that are expressed. We have the light emitting uh, function. Uh, we have the transistor function. Uh, we can optically switch to remote control, not only the output current by light illumination different wavelengths, but also to remote control the uh, emission of light. And that can be interesting for the fabrication of smart display. Uh, so uh, we can work at a uh, spatial control of uh, small emitting pattern in a way that we don't need to use any invasive approach, no need to use a mask. Uh, we can uh, reverse or encode high uh, density visual information, and we can uh, do this at a level that is below uh, the uh, far field uh, diffraction limit. Uh, now, be in mind that the uh, best display that you have accessible are those based on retina, uh, which uh, was a resolution of about 55 uh, square micrometer. Our approach uh, will actually bring us down to a one by one square micrometer. And so we can have a control, uh, you will see over the visible spectra in terms of uh, operation in the green, blue, and red. Uh, now, how we have done that experiment is pretty simple. We first of all have uh, defined the light emitting polymers we wanted to play with. These are commercially available, and these are, have been already been proven uh, to be the right choice if you want to make a light emitting transistor. And so we have one that emits in the green, one in the red, and one in the blue. Based on their energy level, uh, we have actually selected a different type of diarylatin. And I use again the permeation of this diarylatin through the layer of the semiconductor in such a way to have uh, this kind of blending taking place. Now, more precisely, we can use the, that the real thing with terbutyl unit for trapping and detrapping uh, the uh, old transport 
both for the green and the red emitter. But instead, for the blue emitter, we were forced to use another type of dilating that is a defluorinated one. This is all based on the energy level of the semiconductor. Now, the blends are highly luminescent, uh, so it covers very well the spectra in the visible range, and they even stretch in the near infrared up to 800 nanometers. And uh, uh, what uh, I'm going to show you here in this slide is how we can, for the three different types of blend, uh, the, we can trap and detrap the uh, old transport. We can start from the neat uh, polymer, and then we blend with dilutin, we lower a bit the uh, field effect mobility, which actually, uh, when we bring the dilutin to the closed state, the mobility it, it decreases drastically, but this is highly reversible. So we have an on-off ratio of the output current triggered by light that is exceed 500. We can do this very same game by looking at the luminescence. <clears throat> so you can see that uh, actually we have a luminescence that is quenched completely when uh, we bring the dilating into the closed state. Uh, and whereas when it is in the open state, uh, this is still luminescent. And so here we can have again an on-off ratio of the luminescence that exceeds 500. So we can make cycles with the addition with the UV invisible light to uh, trigger the isomerization from open to closed state. When you're in the closed state, you trap charges and you quench luminescence. And you can see that we can do this for all the three type of blends and therefore for the emission of light at different colors. Then actually we can show that we can write an erase pattern. So we start uh, from the case where the dilutin is blended with the green emitting material. And you can see light emission coming uh, from the interdigitated pattern. We illuminate with UV light the whole device, and therefore uh, we uh, create traps and we quench the luminescence. Everything in B is black. Then we can irradiate, uh, a, a, let's say, with our laser, a H light uh, at 532 nanometer, uh, H uh, symbol. And this, in this way, we can recover luminescence in the irradiated uh, part of the sample. We can actually illuminate with visible light uh, the entire sample and recover the, the light emission from the entire device. We can again illuminate with UV light to quench the emission again in E. And then we can, with 352, uh, 532 uh, laser, we can illuminate some specific dots. Uh, so you can see that actually our resolution is extremely high. And uh, as I said, it can reach uh, one by one square micrometer. So this old use potential for the generation next for next generation of display technologies. Now let's see how you can use all this also for a data storage. And of course, the dream is the one of increasing data storage capacity in any electronic device. So you would love your computer to have a, a larger uh, possibility, a possibility to store larger amount of data. Now, increasing the uh, storage capacity in a trying device, this is something that one can try to tackle this grand challenge from the chemistry and from the physics point of view. Now, if you are a physicist, what to think of is to scale down to enable integration of uh, an increasing number of memory cells per unit area. So that means that you play with photolithography and to make smaller and smaller uh, bit area or bit size. This, of course, uh, has a limitation. The limitation is the, the limitation related to photolithography. And uh, just to make it very naive, uh, if in 1990, this was the size of our cell, memory cell, in 1991, this was uh, the new size, 1992, this was a new size, and so on and so forth. So with years, over the years, we are decreasing the size of the cell in which we can store an information. Now, if you want to see the trend over the years, you can just Google and see the evolution of the aerial density as a function of the year. Now, that's a physics approach that is quite expensive. If you are a chemist instead, the way you can solve this problem is the one of keeping the same size of the memory cell, uh, but increase the storage capabilities for multi-level memories. Namely, 
This is the size of the unit cell that we keep always constant. And then if in 1990, you can store in this cell one information, in 1991, four information, in 1992, 16 information. So now the question is how can chemistry allows you to do this? Uh, now, uh, the way to do that is, uh, for example, to write with light and to read electrically. So to use two orthogonal stimuli for the writing and for the reading. That is something that we realized it could work uh, with Tim Leidecker and he was doing his PhD in our group. And we add actually the very same uh, type of blend, the P3ST directly, and I showed you before to make optically switchable transistor. And what he noticed is that depending on the aerial power density of the light, UV light he was using, he could observe a different type of decrease of the current through the junction upon the uh, illumination with UV light. And uh, in particular, if you use a very short passes, you could minimize, like in a few nanoseconds, you could minimize this kind of effect. And so the idea is, again, we go to the cartoon I showed you before, bottom cotton, bottom gate transistor. In the channel, you have a blend of P3ST with the diarylitin. And uh, uh, now here, if you use a low power and ultra fast laser, uh, each pulse, there is a finite number of diarylitin that undergoes isomerization from the open to the closed state. And so we are creating a finite number of traps. And that's what you can see here, that uh, each pulse, you have a decrease of the current through the junction stepwise. And so you can see that each pulse, you have an increased number of, uh, of uh, number ones that appear. And this is reflected by lowering of the current through the junction. And this allows us to make up to over 256 distinct levels, which correspond to 8-bit memories. And then if you want to see more closely, you can see that uh, if in uh, at the beginning of this kind of study, from step five to step eight, you have a three nanoamp uh, step size difference uh, into a decent steps by increasing the number of steps from 51 to 54, we have two nanoamps. From 162 to 164, we have one nanoamp. And from step 333 to 336, you have less than 0 0.5 nanoamp. Uh, so these are, anyway, are well defined, highly reproducible, and therefore it allows us to uh, assess to over 8 bit uh, storage capacity. Now, of course, when you fabricate a memory, it can be your USB key can be uh, your hard disk of your computer. Retention time is very important because you want to come up the day after to have, uh, let's say, your information, your data that is still stored in your hard drive. And so uh, we were lucky that this was published, this work was published in a very slow journal. And actually uh, we could uh, explore our device over a very long period of time and uh, have a retention time that's 16 in 500 days. Now, of course, if you have a USB key, if you have your hard disk, you want to use it more than once. So you need to be able to brighten and erase. And here the erasing can be done by illuminating with visible light. And you can make cycle, you can see here with writing and erasing uh, with a, a very, very high precision, no fatigue at all. And uh, uh, so that uh, gives high reliability over the switching cycle. There is a larger, larger request of supporting uh, electronic device on flexible foils because of the potential for having, uh, let's say, wrappable uh, and uh, wearable devices. And so that is what we have been doing with the same blend and uh, essentially supporting this on a uh, different type of uh, geometry of the device, which is based on a, a polyethylene left turf start support. Uh, I don't want to enter inside the details. You can see that we can make uh, bending at uh, different radii. Uh, for example, you can see that before and after bending, this kind of light responsiveness is retained. Uh, we could uh, also be a kind of uh, uh, retained with a very small decrease of mobility and very slight shift of the threshold voltage. We also found a referee <coughs> that asked us to do some bending cycles. We did over 1,000 bending cycle with a bending radii of 10 millimeters, you can see that information is retained. And uh, therefore, that proposes our system for application in, uh, let's say, wearable devices. Last example I want to share with you 
is the one where we move from bifunctional to trifunctional. And here, we uh, again, we have to interface. Uh, you have to identify a new interface in your device and come up with a new function. And that was the use of uh, the blend of the PCST with the diarity. And here we interface this with the third functionality that is a ferroelectric gate, gate insulator. And uh, now the organic ferroelectric insulating materials that we have chosen is uh, pretty well known. It's here on the right is this PVDF TRFE that is a uh, polyvinyl fluoride trifluoroethylene material, which is known to have a relatively large fatigue free remnant polarization, a short switching time, and a good thermal stability. Uh, the ferroelectric state of the gate insulator will influence the surface potential of the interface of the semiconductor. And in this way, the accumulation depression state of the charge in the device. So in this way, we can actually store information also in this case in a non-volatile manner. And so that is the type of uh, cartoon of our device. Uh, now, uh, how does ferroelectricity work? I think that uh, most of you already knows that if you apply a voltage to a ferroelectric material and this voltage is high enough, uh, it, that such that they exceed the coercive field, the dipole in the ferroelectric layer partially aligned with the external electric field, and this results in a permanent uh, polarization after the removal of the electric field. And in this way, the, let's say the magnitude of the polarization vector depends on the difference between the applied electric field minus the coercive field. And so the number of memory states that uh, can be assessed in the electric uh, memory cell depend on the intermediate polarization state that uh, can be obtained by applying an external electric field that has a magnitude that is slightly higher than a coercive field. So in this way, you can assess to multi-level current state uh, that can be encoded in your material and device. And so that was already demonstrated to be viable uh, by combining organic semiconductor like P3ST with the very same type of electric layer and uh, use this to fabricate multi-level memories by using the partial polarization state of the ferroelectric polymer that you can assess by sweeping the gate voltage. Now, what we have done here is just by uh, integrating this in a device where you have also the photo responsiveness of the diarrhea. So let's start from our, uh, let's say, a type of prototypical device. So uh, we have tested the, in our three terminal device uh, in which we have in the channel the blend of P3C and diarrhea. We place the top gate, uh, that is this ferroelectric gate, and uh, we wanted to modulate the current through junction only by sweeping, first of all, the gate voltage. And we do this in the dark to demonstrate that we can switch the uh, current through junction thanks to the ferroelectric input. And so, uh, first of all, we uh, apply a plus 40 volt to a kind of erase all the previous polarization state and we go down here and then uh, we apply minus 40 volt and uh, that allows us to reach the higher current possible where you have the higher accumulation uh, of charges at the interface with the organic semiconductor this is state that is called p1 you can see that all the dipoles are aligned up then at that point uh, we can lower the voltage and have in this way access to different levels with the partial polarization of the ferroelectric layer. And each state corresponds to a different accumulation condition of the uh, field effect transistor channel, and therefore a different distinct field effect operating point. You can see that when we apply this instead of 40 and minus 40, we apply minus 20 volt, we lower the current to the junction, we reach the level P2, that can be switched from P0 to P2. If we apply minus 17, we reach P3, minus 15, we reach P4, and minus 10 volts, we reach P5, and can be swapped between uh, P0 and P5 by going from zero to minus 10, for example. Now, uh, what actually we uh, uh, have been showing here that we can assess five distinct drain current levels, P1 to P5, due to their ferroelectric partial polarization, uh, with high reversibility, no fatigue over several cycles, and no volatility. Then at that point, we need to show that uh, in this kind of device geometry, we can still uh, use the light responsiveness of the diarrhea. 
and so we can shine light from the bottom from the top sorry and uh, here again we use the three nanosecond laser and uh, uh, we could show that uh, you can see in the plot here we can lower with the time of irradiation we can lower the or number of paths we can lower the current through a junction and assess to 600 current levels and uh, uh, so with the minimal write rate delay of 20 millisecond uh, time scale and the readout uh, that uh, is on the 100 millisecond time scale so that are very fast type of device still very interesting and here in this kind of cartoon uh, in picture here we have combined the use of the responsiveness of the gate voltage uh, due to the so the contribution coming from the ferroelectric material with the uh, uh, which allows to have different partial polarization state in combination with the light that is uh, that is able to change the state of the light they are eating to trap and untrap the transport of charges and therefore in this way we have multiple levels that, that are accessible five coming from the polarization state that are this one here from one zero to five zero and in this kind of prototypical example six that are coming from the light accessible uh, states and so uh, in each uh, current state uh, for each polarization state you can see here we can uh, erase and write the uh, by using green light and a positive gate sweep okay so overall if we combine the ultra fast uh, laser with uh, the six uh, different type of levels that are accessible with the ferroelectric material we can have a maximum storage capacity that is over 11 bit so to sum up uh, i think that i could show you that we can uh, have multifunctionality that is emerging out of combination of different materials and here we use for fabricating memory uh, that uh, can uh, store i have a capacity up to 11 bit per cell with high retention time uh, that is exceeding several months very fast uh, readout and program uh, and there is time scale and this is an approach that is uh, cheap and compatible with uh, suitable for flexible substrate so the overall take home message of my presentation is that you can play with different classes of materials and make photo switchable field effect transistor by uh, tuning the charge injection and metal semiconductor interface or by play with the charge trapping and detrapping in blends you can make in this way photo switchable light emitting transistor you can make the multi-level optical memories and you have uh, multi responses that can be enhanced by uh, combining classes of materials uh, that are responding to different types of stimuli and reaching a, a very high number of levels in memory devices so i think it's all about uh, using all your uh, chemical creativity and expertise to uh, be able to increase the uh, functional complexity of your electronic devices, make it from monofunctional to trifunctional. The way to go is the one of reaching multifunctionality. And uh, how to do it is uh, by integrating the multiple materials in a single device. How to do that is very simple. You have to identify in your, your device where are the interface and find the chemical way to place your chosen function in one specific interface and not in another one and then here in terms of responsiveness you have to think more broadly of systems that respond to different type of uh, stimuli it can be light can be electrochemical can be magnetic stimuli and actually do not hesitate to take all the advantages of the organics so flexibility tunability of properties and so on and so forth with this i like to thank all of you for your very kind attention I like to thank my sponsors that are CNRS University and uh, also European project, for example, my European Research Council project and many other initiatives at the European level that are supporting this activity and my uh, outstanding group of uh, collaborators, of younger collaborators. To do this kind of activity, you need to have a really an interdisciplinary group consisting of chemists and they're indicated with C, but you need also engineers to have a highly working device and unit physicist if you want to study the physics of the device. And uh, with this, again, I'd like to thank all of you for your attention. Do not hesitate uh, uh, for the younger people in the audience 
if you're interested for a next step in your career to uh, consider uh, Strasbourg and this kind of activity as an option, do not hesitate to write me and we can try to see if there are solutions to perform a postdoctoral or PhD experience in my laboratory. And thank you again for your attention and I would be very happy to answer to any question. Uh, thank you very much for very interesting applied presentation and lecture and uh, for your offer because uh, I didn't see uh, Ukrainian scientists in your group and maybe it's time. Well, I have one actually, it's not here in the, this picture, I must uh, admit that it's not the most updated one. I have a PhD student from Ukraine oh, okay. uh, that she's working on chemical sensing based on 2D materials. She started one year ago uh, and by looking forward to receive more. Oh, very nice. Okay, dear colleagues, do you have any questions to our uh, speaker. Yes, uh, Igor, please. Uh, thank you very much for your fantastic talk. It's delighted to see that uh, photo switches are making their way to such uh, for di to different field and especially to electronics. Uh, my question is about uh, degradability, although. Uh, Photo switches, especially Daryl ethylenes, are quite robust, but they are still degradable. And do you see? Uh, do you think this is the problem, a serious problem, and how it could be uh, tackled? Uh, with uh, if 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 you think this this is a problem? Yeah, I mean you are correct in focusing immediately on direlatin because that is the one that suffers less from all the degradability issues, and so. Uh, I always say that uh, I am shocked why most of the community is focusing on uh, isobenzene, while uh, it is, uh, let's say, maybe for some historical reason or simplicity in the synthesis, but the editing is also is not complicated in synthesis. So for electronic application, I we stop to disregard completely the isobenzene. We focus the unique on dieting. Dieting, it's not too bad. It's not as bad that you, you, you are a bit arguing in the sense that uh, it's a molecule. And so any molecule-based device can be argued to be degradable, okay? But after well, all, but, uh, take- In take, organic, uh, in organic yeah. are, yeah, sorry. Take- uh, In the, organic compounds are more stable, yeah. Yeah, but take, uh, I mean, organic device frequently are encapsulated. Take the light emitting diodes of Richard Friend, okay? So these are devices that, uh, once encapsulated, are have a lifetime that should be a, at least 10 years because that is a small LED that you have in your car, that you have uh, in your razor blade, or you can have in other type of devices. So I don't see the dilating to be much worse than the light emitting polymers that uh, have been used to fabricate light emitting devices, okay? So I'm a bit less pessimistic than you. Of course, uh, encapsulation is important. Uh, when you want to get the technology out of it. But that is, uh, is true for all the molecule-based uh, technologies. Yeah, yeah. First of all, it's important to protect them from uh, oxygen, perhaps. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, oxygen and moisture. Uh, moisture. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. But what about photodegradation? Yeah, so directing, you need the... Uh, uh, you just need to watch out that if you radiate too much with UV light, you get a byproduct, and this is irreversible. Okay, is annulated byproduct. That is the danger when you play with the dielectric. Otherwise, the, there is not much of photodegradation. Of course, that is something that you can, uh, as we were mentioning before, with diary, uh, with the uh, well spiral pattern, but more with azoban. This is something that. Uh, you 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 will suffer. So uh, the photogradation for these two photo switches, it, it is something that one has to deal with, and uh, it's a problem. It's, it's a problem that has not been solved yet. Okay. Okay, colleagues, do you have other questions? I don't see. What about uh, practical application of your memory chips? Do you have any perspective for this? Well, as I, I'm a scientist, I'm not a technologist. So <laughs> the, I, 
and actually we have 24 hours a day so we cannot uh, extend that uh, the yeah so each now and then we do patent things but to be honest uh, we never brought this to a to a next level which is something that uh, one would need uh, for for really going to practical application we suffer a bit also from the fact that uh, locally uh, Strasbourg is a very rich area for what concerns all the interfaces with, uh, uh, let's say, biopharma. There is a lot of spin-off, uh, and uh, there is a lot of, uh, let's say, transfer of uh, knowledge from the academic to the private. Mm -hmm. For what concerns more materials-oriented type of activity, there is much less here for some historical reason. So that doesn't help. Okay. So... Your colleagues, other question, comments about this very nice presentation. No. Okay, dear professor, uh, summary. Thank you again for your nice talk. For Thank this, you very very much for this piece of chemistry, material science, and physics. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, if I the last message is use your creativity because uh, you know molecules and just play with them. Let them express their function. Yes, if you have a rich area like Strasbourg <laughs> and you have yeah. a special equipment and you have a grant, okay, yes, you can play with, with these molecules. Very nice presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you and all the very best. So, see you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.